Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight. I'm Brandis Friedman. Paris Schutz has the evening off. On the show tonight. These are uh, bold ideas that's going to bring bold changes. Just weeks after adjourning, legislators are heading back to Springfield. We'll tell you why. What could drier than normal weather mean for your garden and greater climate? A climate change specialist and floral expert join us. I was not shocked. Uh, we have a regressive and unfair tax system. A bombshell expose by ProPublica finds that some of the richest men in America pay little to no tax, even as their wealth grows by billions. How discussions on critical race theory have moved from the classroom to politicians' offices. We would kind of jokingly say, if you have a Rembrandt that you're pretty sure is real, don't send it to us. Hear about a Chicago-based scientist who helped find art world frauds and is featured in a recently released Netflix docuseries. Another corporate data breach, a mall owner goes bankrupt, and good news for airline employees, we'll have the latest business headlines with Cranes. In the wake of Mayor Lori Lightfoot's comments on the diversity of Chicago media, hear from leaders of local journalist associations on why they say newsrooms need to do better. And a hard hat tour of a spectacular restoration taking place in the historic Grand Army of the Republic Memorial Hall in the Chicago Cultural Center. But first, some of today's top stories. Chicago Public Schools will soon have an interim CEO. The district announced Jose Torres will lead CPS while the city searches for a permanent CEO. Torres was superintendent of the Elgin School District 46 for six years and was a regional superintendent at CPS. Current CEO Janice Jackson, who is leaving at the end of the month, said choosing Torres was an easy decision. What's even more important is that he's competent and he's able to do this work, and I have 150% confidence in his ability to do that. He's a veteran educator who has decades of experience working in different roles and with all students. The city of Chicago will make June 19th, also known as Juneteenth, an official city holiday, the mayor announced today. The day commemorates the end of slavery in the United States. 49th Ward Alderperson Maria Haddon said the observance of the holiday is both celebration and resistance. Some would have us ignore our history, gloss over it, in service to just moving on. They tell us that our calls to acknowledge the wrongs that we faced are dividing us. But don't heed their call. Do not be silent, for there can be no healing without truth and reconciliation. And Governor J.B. Pritzker is deploying the National Guard to respond to a chemical fire in Rockton, Illinois, which is just south of the Wisconsin border. The fire started this morning at ChemTool, one of the largest grease manufacturers in the United States. Authorities have issued a mandatory evacu evacuation order near the plant. Instead of risking chemical runoff in the nearby Rock River, firefighters are allowing the fire to burn itself out, which could take several days. And Taste of Chicago is returning this July, but not as its typical large downtown festival. Instead, there will be pop-up food and music events across the city between July 7th and 11th. City officials say more than 40 eateries are participating in the events. For more on the schedule of events, visit WTTW.com slash news. Illinois legislators left Springfield a couple of weeks ago, but already they are heading back. Amanda Venicky joins us now with a rundown on why. And Amanda, what is on the docket that's calling the General Assembly back to the Capitol now when they normally wouldn't be returning until the fall? Yeah, Brandis, it is unusual for legislators to be called back in, to the Capitol in the summer, particularly when they have already accomplished their major constitutional duty, and that is passing a budget. But this time around, it is not really a surprise. Legislative leaders in May, upon adjourning for the regular session, signaled that lawmakers would be called back to the Capitol to take up major energy legislation that has been a long time coming. Pastor Scott Anque of St. Luke's Missionary Baptist Church on Chicago's South Side has been part of energy talks on behalf of the organization Faith in Place for three years. He says what they've come up with is the most comprehensive and boldest energy package in the nation. If we stay on the same path, um, we're going to do more damage to the climate than ever. And so we have to start now thinking about our future. 
What kind of world will we leave our children? Now, there is widespread agreement there that something has to be done on energy, in part because Exxon is threatening to close several money losing nuclear energy plants unless lawmakers approve a subsidy for them. And that is dicey because of the corruption scandal that has engulfed Exxon subsidiary ComEd. But without those new plants, Illinois can't meet its goal of getting to all clean energy by the year 2050. Plus, those nuclear plants employ a lot of union jobs. Now, the current proposal has customers paying nearly $700 million to Exelon to keep those plants open. It is a hefty chunk of money, but not nearly what the company had been asking for. Exelon is no longer in a negotiating room. The, they're, they're not in charge of this legislation. They don't have their uh, 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 hands around the necks of politicians uh, in Springfield any longer. These are uh, bold ideas that's going to bring bold changes and bold opportunities to communities that have often been left behind. But Abe Scar of Illinois' Public Interest Research Group sees it differently. To me, it looks like Exelon and ComEd, as they are with the formulated policies, still having a lot of power and still being able to get the policies they want, even if there's not a good independent justification for it. Her just today came out with a new report that finds that the energy package on the table would boost ComEd's profits in another way by keeping in place portions of a formula that SCAR says guarantees it will make profits worth an estimated $700 to $900 million over the next four years. He says it is difficult to translate what that could mean for a customer's electric bill. Customer bills have, on the delivery side, the, pay, the part they pay to ComEd, have gone up 39% um, during formula rates. Um, we would think that we would see something similar, if not greater, um, than that. Now, this formula rate issue is far from the only dent in the legislation. Even with lawmakers heading back to the Capitol, there isn't a final deal, no language for them to vote on. The big fight right now is over when and how to phase out carbon emitting coal plants. Also, you have a coalition of business organizations begging lawmakers to delay passing anything because they say it will saddle them with higher electric bills. At a minimum, we project the first installment of the cost increase on businesses and municipalities to be $700 million annually, including an additional $215 million to pay for new programs paid for by tax ratepayers without their input. In a nutshell, this legislation will be a credit card that keeps spending money without any accountability, period. Governor J.B. Pritzker's office has pushed back on that criticism. Meanwhile, you have advocates hopeful that a deal is going to get through, but at least one legislator who is part of talks that I talked with said that it's quite possible that nothing happens on energy this week. Now, if so, legislators do have a couple of other measures on their agenda for tomorrow and Wednesday. I also spoke this afternoon with State Representative Delia Ramirez, a Chicago Democrat, who is sponsor of the CPS elected school board measure that has already passed the state Senate. And she says she is going to call it for a vote in the House. Ramirez says she has not spoken at all with Mayor Lori Lightfoot about it. She says the administration has not contacted her. So she says colleagues from the Black Caucus have told her the mayor's been in touch asking them to vote no. This particular plan would transition CPS leadership with some appointed and some elected members of the school board until it would be all elected come 2027. Also got in touch with the House sponsor of a measure that would implement optional fingerprinting for firearm owners, identification card applicants. It would also mandate background checks during person-to-person -person gun sales. He also says he plans to bring that for a vote, and that would be significant because thus far, after years of trying, it has stalled. Brandis, we could see a couple of other more minor bills taken up for action this week, including some fixes to the budget and something on unemployment insurance. So we'll be watching. Back to you. Amanda, thank you. It seems in general, people don't prefer rain on their weekend, but rainfall the last few days was surely welcomed by some Chicagoans. 
That's because 3.75 inches of total precipitation in Chicago between March and May makes for the city's third driest spring since record keeping began in 1871, according to the state, the Illinois state climatologist. As of today, the National Weather Service classifies the northern part of Cook County as falling under severe drought conditions. Joining us to discuss the drier than normal weather and its impact are Julie Janoski, the Morton Arboretum's plant clinic manager, and Scott Collis, an atmospheric scientist at Argonne National Laboratory. Welcome back to both of you. Scott, starting with you, please. From your perspective, how unusual are these recent conditions? Well, this is what we call a flash drought. We went from last year having one of the wettest Mays on record to the second driest May on record. We are really falling behind in rainfall. And while there was some much needed rainfall this weekend, it fell in a really patchy manner. And, and Julie, what kind of impact does this drought have on our local ecosystem? Well, it's going to have both short-term and long-term impacts at this point. Um, the, the soil is very dry, down to about 10 or 12 inches, in fact. And so um, in the short term, you're going to see plants wilting. You'll see crispy leaves, a little bit of scorch, um, possibly even some, some plant death. Um, long term, however, what this is doing, this dryness is killing the root systems of trees and, and shrubs. Um, and so over time, they'll be unable, once we do get some water, to absorb as much water as they used to. So it's going to have a long-term impact as well as the short-term. Scott, on a national scale, what kinds of drought conditions um, are different parts of the country experiencing? So as Julie said, you know, in the Midwest, we're kind of seeing this north-south gradient from some drought to severe drought. It's really bad out west. So from Colorado through Nevada to California, we're at historic drought levels right as we go into this year's fire season. And so, Julie, how should anyone who's tending their yard or garden, what should they be doing to compensate for the drought? Um, if it's available and if you are able, you should be watering. Um, water all of your plants as much as, as you can. Um, you don't have to do it every day long slow watering is much more effective um, over you know once a week rather than doing 15 minutes every day um, but even big old trees who people think are immune to these sorts of droughts are going to be affected by this one um, and so if you've got trees in your yard that have been there a long time even those will need some water at this point scott what impact uh has the the drier than normal weather had on local lake levels so lake levels are sitting at around about 36 inches above normal. And why that might sound like really full, they're down 20 inches from this time last year, from the record lake levels we had last year. So when you think about an average lake level, we're almost halfway back to that average level in less than a year. And given the volumes of the Great Lake and the fact that we lose most of our water from the Great Lakes through evaporation, that's phenomenal. And it really is a signature of just how dry it's been. And, and Julie, are there certain things um, or to plant that are more drought resistant? Uh, maybe a way you could spare yourself uh, some of that added watering. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there are trees and shrubs, things like, um, you know, sumacs and um, nine barks and some oak trees that are really tolerant of drought once they're established. Um, the trick is, is that if they're new plants, then you really do still need to water them. On the flip side of that, are there some plants that just don't do very well in droughts at all? Absolutely. And I think you'll see that starting to happen now. We're seeing birches losing their leaves early with yellowing leaves. We're seeing red bud leaves starting to curl up a little bit. Um, we're seeing some scorch on, on a number of other things. So yeah, there are a number of things that just do not tolerate drought at all. Scott, you know, Chicago saw its driest spring since uh, the 1930s. What, you know, what would you say, what does that tell you about the relationship between droughts and climate change? So you can't attribute any one drought or any one storm to climate change. What climate change does is it loads the dice. So if you had a six-sided dice and let's say every time you rolled a one, you'd get uh, drought, um, especially a flash drought in some areas, 
that's the case. You're going to roll that one more often. So with climate change, it's a little tricky because it's not just about drought. In actual fact, most climate change projections have Illinois seeing more rain, but more rain in more extreme events with greater drier periods between. So, you know, as a plant lover and looking out to my beloved red buds in my front garden, it's something that doesn't make me happy listening to what Julie's saying. Yeah. Um, would you normally expect more thunderstorms uh, during this time of year? Yes, if you like thunderstorms, you have been sorely disappointed. Chicago's peak storm season is in this, you know, May through June type of period. And what's really happened is we've had all the ingredients. It's been hot. It's been humid. So everything at the surface seems like it's lining up but the upper atmosphere hasn't cooperated. We don't have that cold air that's fought down by the jet stream above us. So we've got this warm air above, which is effectively capping those thunderstorms. They actually bring so much of Chicago's springtime and early summertime rainfall. And Julie, what kind of summer conditions would you like to see for better plant growth? Well, I mean, ideally it would rain at least an inch once a week, right? Because for Midwestern plants, that's sort of the rule of thumb. Um, you're hoping that everybody gets an inch of rain or an inch of water a week. Um, at this point, we'd be happy with anything. Um, any rain at all in the next few months would be really helpful. Not that it's up to any of us anyway to, to pick the weather, but I'm sure some rain would be nice. We'll have to leave it there. My thanks to Julie Janoski and Scott Collis for joining us. Thank you. Last week, Florida became the latest state to ban schools from teaching critical race theory. Critical race theory isn't a single lesson or curriculum as such, but a, a teaching, a way of teaching different ideas about privilege, systemic bias, and racism. But the term has moved from the academic circles into lawmakers' offices over whether it should be taught in secondary schools. Joining us to answer that and more are Nathan Hoffman, an advisor with the Foundation Against Intolerance and Racism, and Illinois State Representative LaShawn Ford, whose West Side District includes much of the Austin community. Gentlemen, welcome and welcome back to Chicago tonight. Um, Nathan Hoffman, let's start with you, please. How would you define critical race theory? Well, I, I don't know that it's as much about how I would define critical race theory, but I, I would say, as I understand it, um, the critical race theory goes back, sort of the idea of it goes back, you know, several decades, and it's built on the idea that uh, America at its core is, is, a, is a racist uh, place and that there are sort of permanent oppressors and permanent uh, groups of people who are oppressed. And in that case, we're talking about uh, white individuals being the oppressors and black individuals uh, being the oppressed. Representative uh, Ford, how do you view uh, critical race theory? You know, Brandis, I view it simply as an examination of how our laws intersect with issues in society as it relates to race. And when you think about it, you think about how you have at least 13 percent of society being the blacks that believe that we need to examine how um, more black people are incarcerated, how the war on drugs impacted black people more, why um, black people are more disproportionately impacted by the laws that we have. We have to examine that critically. Nathan, what is your concern uh, with teaching CRT, as it's often called in short, uh, with teaching that theory in schools? But I, I think with my understanding of, of the theory, I think the concern is that it, it is sort of an ideology that um, has, has largely been, until recently, um, kept within sort of the elite institutions and sort of the, the elite political circles for a matter of, of intellectual debate. And I think the, the challenge comes in when you bring that into uh, classrooms, particularly elementary age classrooms where students um, don't yet have the ability to, to, to think critically and they're at, at that point learning how to learn. And so when you introduce some of these um, very contentious uh, uh, pieces of information and theories, it, 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 it's challenging and sort of takes away from the, what I believe should be the central focus of, of education, which is a strong uh, base of literacy, math instruction and things like that. Representative Ford, do you think it's important that students are taught um, some age appropriate level of, of critical race theory? You know, every child should um, be thinking critically no matter what they're doing and what they've been taught. We can no longer allow um, students to just go in and 
learn the spelling words and and just remember things. They have to critically understand why things are happening the way they're happening. They have to know, and that's what critical um, race theory is about. If you take away race, we know that our focus in um, higher education and any education is to make sure that students think critically. Uh, Nathan, why do you believe this theory has become a bit of a political football over the last year, but especially in recent months? Well, I, I think that you have a number of high-profile political figures from the, the, the previous president uh, of the United States to, to uh, officials uh, in Congress today who have elevated the issue. And I think, um, you know, the big, the big challenge with an idea like critical race theory or these, these other sort of um, uh, contentious issues is it brings out the worst of both sides. And I think it brings out performative politics. Um, it doesn't really allow for these types of uh, uh, nuanced conversations, because I do think there is a middle ground and in, in, in a way that we should be looking at this. Um, in, in terms of a lot, I agree with a lot of what Representative Ford said. Sh students should be thinking critically. They should understand history, all of the history, the good and the bad. Um, I think the challenge is it's become a politicized issue uh, that it's more interested in performance than substance. Representative Ford, why do you think this has gotten to be political all of a sudden? Because people fear change and they fear that um, when you bring about change, it's going to impact their way of life. But that's not the case. And I have to tell you, Brenda, if you have children and everyone that has children, they know that children always say why. Children are born to critically think. They want to know why things are happening. And we have to make sure that we teach them critical thinking. And so I think that when you have a certain segment of our population where everything seems to be going well for them, they don't want to change it. But we know that just today, we realized that the city of Chicago, you said, will recognize Juneteenth. There are a lot of people that didn't understand that, and they don't understand why it's important to recognize it. That's critical thinking. Nathan, you know, if, if not through critical race theory, which is something that may or may not be already being taught in schools, how should schools um, teach and discuss uh, racism in that history? Well, well, I think actually uh, Representative Ford just hit on a, on a really good point, which is that, that uh, the Juneteenth holiday, and, and certainly I, I can say that I'm not super far removed from, from high school, and I, and I don't recall learning about Juneteenth um, in school. So I do think there is a conversation to be had about what does the history curriculum look like that we're teaching in schools? And I think that's an honest conversation that, that we can all have. Um, there's a lot of things that we can do there from, from different curriculum forms and, and different things like that. I think the challenge becomes when you get to the more radical parts of critical race theory, which, which look at students uh, based solely on sort of these surface level uh, diversity features like race and try to lump them into certain circumstances as either privileged uh, oppressors or, or, or the opposite. And, and I think we should stay focused on individuals and sort of uh, the, the character and, and things that they bring as individuals, not as uh, some service level diversity feature they have. What do you say to some teachers, um, because they've been sort of caught in the middle of this, Nathan, who feel a bit controlled by these laws, maybe they're limited if they had some plans for teaching, um, and they're concerned now about whether or not a plan for teaching a piece of black history and American history um, might be somehow touched by a state's new law that bans critical race theory. Yeah, I, I have to say that I, I'm generally opposed to uh, a, a lot, any mandate that, that's going to make it more difficult for teachers to, um, you know, to, to, to do their craft in the classroom. I think we need to uh, ensure that there are certain uh, guiding principles in place um, that, that, that uh, look at what specifically we need to have students learn in the classroom. But besides that, I think we ought to leave it to teachers to figure out uh, how how that is ultimately taught. And Representative Ford, in about you know 30 seconds, what do some of these bans in other states? What do you think that says about how Americans view race and history? They want to see history as it is, and as we said on your show before, history should not be something that makes us feel good. It should tell the truth. And we know now that the 1619 Project is out, and people fear teaching the 1619 Project simply because we don't teach students how to critically think. And so we need to make sure that the history that we're teaching, we have to recognize that it is flawed and it is bad if it's not accurate and if it doesn't tell the whole story. So it's doing more damage than even thinking about teaching critical race theory in our educational systems.
Okay. My thanks to you both. That's where we'll have to leave it. Nathan Hoffman and Representative LaShawn Ford for joining us. Thank you for having us. Up next, the role a Chicago-based microscopic analyst played in trying to solve a famous heist. Stay with us. It really is about community where we all come together. Chicago needs to make space for everyone. The recently released Netflix documentary, This is a Robbery, explores the twisted story surrounding the theft of 13 pieces of art from Boston's Ila Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in 1990. One of the potential paths to recovering the $500 million in stolen artwork involves scientific analysis of paint chips. As Chicago Tonight's Nick Blumberg reports, that microscopic detective work was done by an innovator in the field based in Chicago. The enormity of it, I mean, you can imagine, is just overwhelming. After the middle of the night heist, investigators, museum officials, and journalists spent years going down dead ends. One lead came into former Boston Herald reporter Tom Mashberg. A petty crook claimed to have one of the stolen works, Rembrandt's Storm on the Sea of Galilee. But Mashberg was no art expert and needed to prove the work was authentic. But we sort of thought about paint chips. And I said, well, would it be that hard? You know, to scrape a little paint off. Walter McCrone out of Chicago had done a lot of work debunking frauds using an electron microscope. Well, not exactly. In fact, McCrone championed a somewhat simpler but no less powerful tool, the polarized light microscope, as he told WTTW's The New Explorers in 1990. It's sort of an underdog. Uh, people have assumed that it wouldn't be necessary or even useful anymore because of the big guns. And I'm absolutely convinced that we can't get along without it. After studying at Cornell, McCrone took a research job in Chicago in 1944. In 1960, he founded the McCrone Research Institute in Bronzeville. It's now run by his protege, Gary Laughlin. For all of the years that I worked with him, which was the first 17 years of my career, he started his day at 3.30 a.m. And I never saw him leave this building or quit work um, until after he listen to the news at 6 p.m. <laughs> each night, seven days a week. The Institute's still carrying on the mission Macron started, research, publishing a journal, hosting symposia, and teaching intensive courses on how to use a microscope, learning to identify substances, shape, size, color, transparency. The students' range is enormous. They come from every industry, from academia, from the government, Virtually any laboratory where a scientist might be working and a microscope might be present. Since the Institute was founded in 1960, more than 30,000 students have come through its doors from around the country and around the world. McCrone also gained worldwide notoriety for analyzing hundreds of pieces of artwork and other historical objects. Among the high-profile pieces McCrone put under his microscope, the Shroud of Turin, the alleged burial shroud of Jesus, stained with marks that devotees claimed was blood. His conclusion was that there was no blood, that these were a pigment, in fact, red ochre. To trained eyes like McCrone's or Laughlin's, two colors that might appear identical on canvas look very different under a microscope. Take French ultramarine, for example. This one is synthetic, so this one is modern. Um, the original ultramarine was a crushed up rock, lapis, which is very, very expensive. And of course, because it's so expensive, nobody uses it today. Now, if a forger knew that, they would use the original material. They would even grind it themselves and make their own pigments the way the original artist may have done. I hate to suggest it, but a microscopist might make a good forger. <laughs> That's absolutely true. In fact, Dr. McCrone used to give a talk, what every good forger should know. After McCrone used his polarized light microscope to analyze a work, he handed his results to Laughlin to confirm them with an electron microscope, including on the analysis of the alleged Rembrandt. And his conclusion right away with that limited palette, he was only given a few chips was that, yes, this certainly could be a Rembrandt. And that was the question that was asked of him. Meaning the paint chips could have come from one of Rembrandt's contemporaries as well. A stickler for detail, McCrone wrote in a correction on his copy of the Boston Herald's article about his work. Sadly, the paint chips ended up being yet another glimmer of false hope for recovering the stolen art. You go through so many of these that you just get exhausted from, you know, the high that you think you're on it. 
and then the terrible disappointment when it's not real. McCrone's work analyzing art may have been exciting, but Gary Laughlin says that was really a side project. The heart of McCrone's work, teaching people about microscopic analysis, continues today. The pandemic forced a pivot to online learning and a huge drop in enrollment, but things are finally on the upswing. You know that there's this, this, this instrument that can do things that, that you know no other instrument can do, and you want to share that with the world. What you're doing is magnifying these little particles up to the size that we normally see macroscopic objects. And if we can recognize all of these things here, just at sight, you can do the same thing under the microscope. It's that easy. For Chicago Tonight, I'm Nick Blumberg. Walter McCrone died in 2002. As for that suspected Rembrandt that he analyzed paint chips from, neither it nor any of the other pieces stolen from the Gardner Museum have been recovered. Still to come on Chicago Tonight, a data breach at McDonald's, good news for United Airlines workers, and more business headlines from cranes. A trove of leaked IRS tax returns analyzed by ProPublica reveals America's richest billionaires, including Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos, often pay little to no income tax. The Chicago Cultural Center reopens to the public and gets an important part of its 19th century history restored. And in the wake of Mayor Lori Lightfoot's comments on the diversity of Chicago media, we hear from leaders of local journalist groups about why they say newsrooms need more diversity. But first, some more of today's top stories. Chicago will recognize June 19th, known as Juneteenth, as an official city holiday, the mayor said today. The day commemorates the end of slavery in the United States. During the announcement, Mayor Lightfoot said the journey to equity and inclusion continues today. Slavery might have officially ended in 1865, but we are still grappling with the vestiges of that original sin here today. From historic neighborhood disinvestment to institutionalized racism that holds our people back from realizing their God-given potential just because of the color of their skin. A former superintendent of Elgin School District 46 will serve as Chicago Public Schools interim CEO. Mayor Lori Lightfoot announced today Jose Torres will lead the school district while the city searches for a permanent CEO. Torres spent two years as regional superintendent at CPS. Current CEO Janice Jackson says she is confident in Torres' ability to run the district in the interim upon her departure at the end of the month. And that's one of the things that really gives me great ease as we make this transition is that he believes what we believe. He believes in our kids. He believes in equity. And he believes in doing every single thing within his power to make sure that kids get the education that they need. And so for that, um, it's an extraordinary honor to be passing um, the baton to him today. And I know that he will make us all proud. DePaul University's president will leave his position next summer. The university announced today Gabriel Esteban will step down next June after serving five years as president. Esteban said in a statement he is leaving to focus on his, quote, personal and familial energy. DePaul's board of trustees says it will start a national search for the next president in the fall. And not only do we have a drought, as you heard earlier, but June has also been hotter than usual. The temperature has reached 90 degrees or higher 10 days so far this month. That's according to the National Weather Service's reporting station in Rockford. This sets an all-time record for the most days with temps at or above 90 degrees so early in the month. The owner of a prominent suburban mall files for bankruptcy. One of Chicago's largest companies falls victim to a cyber attack and furloughs are likely over for United Airlines employees as travel rebounds. Here to go behind the headlines is Crane's Chicago business editor, Ann Dwyer. So, Ann, we know that the owner of the Lincolnwood Town Center Mall and other local properties is filing for bankruptcy. What do we know about this company's future? Well, right now, Brandis, this bankruptcy filing will allow this company, Washington Prime, basically to stay in business while it works out new deals with a raft of creditors. Uh, and as you mentioned, the local malls that this company owns include Lincolnwood Town Center, but also some similar properties in Orland Park, uh, Waukegan, and Countryside. Now, going forward, I think it's reasonable to expect that we're going to see more bankruptcies like this, or at least debt restructurings. Because let's face it, even before the pandemic, the retail industry was uh, in bad, a bad way. 
Uh, and now, uh, even with the, the, the economy starting to warm up again uh, post-COVID, it didn't happen soon enough for some retailers. And also, the, the online shopping habits that we all developed during the lockdown are likely to persist post-COVID. And that's not good news for retail real estate invest investors either. Now, McDonald's is reporting a breach of some customer data, and, you know, it's just becoming uh, the latest in a series of corporations that have experienced these kind of cyber attacks. What do we know about what's driving them? Well, there's a host of factors, but one of the ones that's most uh, relevant to the McDonald's story is one that's common across a lot of consumer-facing companies like McDonald's, and that is these companies are curating a raft of personal information about their customers, everything from uh, credit card numbers to ordering habits. And of course, this is all designed to make the buying experience easier and frankly, to make it easier for these companies to market their products and services to you. Uh, but it also creates a really target rich environment for hackers. And after the past year, we're starting to see uh, air travel numbers are rebounding, of course. It sounds like that's good news for United Airlines employees. It is, uh, especially because the industry have been bracing for a round of furloughs uh, that were expected to have to kick in in October when federal COVID aid is expected to, uh, to end. Um, but it turns out that the market has turned around to such an extent that ramp workers and customer service agents and flight attendants at United Airlines are being told, never mind, those furloughs aren't, aren't likely to happen this year. Um, we're going to need each and every person all hands on deck because uh, the industry is expecting uh, a major rebound to continue. In fact, at O'Hare, uh, capacity is about, at about 80% of where it was at this time last year. Uh, and that's pretty extraordinary when you consider that we were flat on our backs uh, in the aviation industry this time last year. Okay, more to come. As always, our thanks to Ann Dwyer at Crane Chicago Business. Thanks, Brandis. Coming up, the implications of a huge investigation into how much taxes prominent billionaires pay. But first, a look at the weather. A bombshell report from ProPublica based on a vast trove of leaked tax returns of the super wealthy has revealed that some of the richest people on the planet pay little to no income tax. The report found the 25 richest Americans, including the likes of Amazon's Jeff Bezos and Tesla's Elon Musk, collectively paid what's called a true tax rate of just 3.4 percent, even as their wealth grew by billions. Senator Bernie Sanders of Vermont wasn't shocked as he reacted to the report when it was released last week. We have a regressive and unfair tax system. We have a corrupt political system in which the wealthy are able to make huge campaign contributions uh, and have all kinds of lobbyists here on Capitol Hill. Uh, and then if you're rich, unlike an ordinary working person, you have dozens of lawyers and accountants helping you take advantage of every loophole that is out there. Joining us now to discuss the U.S. tax system and how billionaires can legally pay so little is Northwestern University law professor and tax law specialist Charlotte Crane. Professor Crane, thank you for joining us. So, from thank what you for I having me. Absolutely. So from what I understand, there is nothing to suggest that the likes of Jeff Bezos and Mike Bloomberg and Warren Buffett have done anything uh, to break the law, but explain how some of the richest men on the planet have been able to avoid paying taxes on all that wealth? Well, the richer you are, in fact, the easier it is to avoid paying taxes as your wealth increases. Because the federal income tax only reaches wealth that is transformed by selling your assets, not wealth as it grows. So if you can live by not cashing in your wealth, you never owe any income tax. Well, how do you do that? Well, you, the easiest way to do that is by borrowing against that wealth. So if you have $500 million, somebody will readily 
lend you $10 million and you can spend that $10 million on whatever you want and never pay any taxes on the cash that you're using to support your consumption. Now, ProPublica yeah. calculated that the 25 richest Americans, they're paying what's called, uh, what the article called a true tax rate of only 3.4% based on their wealth, not their income. Um, from, by your understanding of how they came to that number, is that a fair, legitimate calculation? So it may be. I have not had a chance, none of us have, to really look at the data that they have used. But I believe that what they did was use the increase in their wealth as a measure of what could have been subject to tax and compare that with the amount that was actually paid into tax. So their calculations expanded the income tax base to include not just the cash flow streams that we expect to be included in the income tax, but also the simple increases in value that these very rich people have accomplished. There is the possibility that the income tax could be expanded to reach those increases, but that's not what the tax we have now does and and I if hopefully I want to be able to come back to that shortly um, but you know for now why are wealth and in particular investment income why are they taxed differently from other sorts of income like wages okay so wages are taxed as you earn them and you have very little choice but to pay them because most people who are receiving wages from an employer their employer is obligated to withheld, hold, and pay over those taxes or pay out of their own pockets. So those of us who only get wages have very little opportunity to avoid those taxes, whether or not we would be willing to break the law in order to do it. The very rich can arrange things so that their cash flow is harder to find either by having offshore bank accounts or by being involved in fairly complicated uh, financial arrangements whereby the income that they receive as partners is received by other partnerships and is received by other partnerships in ways that it's very hard for the government to actually find those income streams and nobody's obligated to collect tax and from on the people who ultimately have the income. but. Hang on, what the very richest that the ProPolica report was observing wasn't anything nefarious. It was just the fact that the increase in wealth, the rise in stock prices, isn't included in the tax base at all. Interest and dividends are. Capital gains, when they're taxed, are when you actually sell your capital gains are taxed admittedly at lower rates but those rates are still 20 percent which is not and what from a policy rates. standpoint though republicans argue that this kind of tax uh promotes investment and helps grow the economy uh, by not including that wealth in the tax base um that probably is true um, there certainly is a good argument that you don't want to burden um, investment too much or people will just not bother to invest. There is a more difficult problem that's a technical problem that doesn't get talked about as much, which is if we were to expand the tax base so that these increases in wealth were included, for instance, by taxing people on the increase in the value of the stock they hold. That's a common one. It would be easy to do, but it would be only easy to do with respect to publicly traded stock. It would push people into investment structures that were less easily valued, and that would complicate financial stru uh, capital structures enormously and capital markets would suffer. So the problem 
is a difficult one if what you think the problem is is not taxing increases in wealth because the more you try to tax mere increases in wealth the more disruptive your tax law is going to be of those capital markets and in fact and, and the we know rich are going to have an advantage sorry in professor crane we're Yep. Yeah, sorry to interrupt. We're actually out of time, but we know that Democrats are said to be looking at a tax package, um, so there could be some changes in there. Obviously, all eyes are on Washington to find out uh, how that all goes down. In the meantime, our thanks to Professor Charlotte Crane for joining us. Thank you for having me. Up next, breathing new life into one of Chicago's cultural icons. The Chicago Cultural Center reopened this month and part of it is getting a very careful new coat of paint. The building remains a mecca of arts and culture, but when it opened in 1897, it served as the central library and a memorial hall for Civil War veterans. That hall has become a hard hat zone of restoration and preservation. Producer Mark Vitale explored the site and caught up with the city's cultural historian. When Chicago decided to build a library on Michigan Avenue, part of the land was owned by a group of Illinois Civil War veterans. So the city dedicated an opulent hall on the north end of the building for the men who fought for the north. It was a meeting space, the 19th century equivalent of the VFW, and it served the Union veterans of the Grand Army of the Republic, the GAR. The GAR Memorial Hall is currently undergoing a vigorous restoration. The site is now the front line for a small army of workers caring for a piece of history. Much of the work is done on scaffolding 30 feet above the floor. First, they tackle the rotunda. Art glass that had been falling apart has been removed for repair off-site, leaving the raw skeleton of the dome. Another team does forensic analysis on paint finishes to determine the original colors. It's time-consuming work. We spent well over a year in the research. But the, really the key thing was doing the physical investigation to expose the, the color scheme and to see what it was and how they had achieved it and then, to, and then to do the mock ups to see how we could replicate it. It wasn't a simple paint job. The colors are actually made by laying up as many as five different colors thinly on top of each other to create the finished color. This neoclassical palace of granite and limestone was designed by the same firm that designed the Art Institute four years earlier. 1897 was when the building opened up, and this was part of a big effort that followed around the time of the 1893 World's Fair and continuing into the 1890s and the 20th century, where Chicago wanted to demonstrate that it wasn't just some upstart young city of stockyards and smokestacks, this was a city of culture. This building almost was toast years ago. And it was only a limited number of people who were standing up for it, but it managed to survive, and not only survive, it was repurposed. The city's cultural historian officially retired early this year, but he is as busy as ever. I'm the cultural historian emeritus, so I'm still on the job. It's a good gig. Why would I give that up? Chicago is great that it has this amazing energy. It has this ability to do things and not follow the rules. And so there's a lot of kind of guts and chutzpah to everything it does. And it's often over the top. And it uh, will result in things of great cultural and artistic values. It's almost like an ordinary adventure, some really smart kid, you know, the way it evolved. Will the kid ever grow up? And of course, even for myself, is the kid and me ever going to grow up? I hope neither one of us do, because it's what still keeps things interesting, still keeps it evolving. For Chicago Tonight, this is Mark Vitale. The Grand Army of the Republic Memorial Hall remains closed while restoration continues into next year. But the Cultural Center is open and back to hosting free visual art and performance programs presented by the city's Department of Cultural Affairs and Special Events. And now, here's Angel Edo with a discussion on diversity in local media from a conversation that first aired on Chicago Tonight Black Voices. 
Mayor Lori Lightfoot kicked off a firestorm of criticism in local and national media when she announced that interviews about her second anniversary as mayor would only be given to reporters of color. Now, the mayor said that she was hoping to counteract the, quote, overwhelming whiteness and maleness of Chicago media. And while there was plenty of speculation as to her reasons for that announcement, her comments have thrown a spotlight on diversity in Chicago. Joining us now are Brandon Pope, president of the Chicago chapter of the National Association of Black Journalists, and Laura Rodriguez Presa, social media coordinator for the Chicago chapter of the Na National Association of Hispanic Journalists. So Brandon, let's start with you. Would you say that Mayor Lightfoot's strategy was a good one to address the problem of newsroom diversity? The strategy itself, no, because there wasn't any coordination um, or contact with NABJ or NAHJ before even jumping into it. So right there, we have to question motives. You start thinking politics, you start thinking PR. Um, it, just, it was a bad rollout. However, you know, I'm hoping that it came from a good place because the, the issue is real and the issue needs to be addressed. Newsroom diversity is a problem, but that's just, a, it's a fight that we've been leading um, not the mayor usually, and we want the mayor to join us in leading the fight, uh, not just kind of going on our own thing. Laura, what are your thoughts on how the mayor handled this situation? Completely agree with Brandon. I think that the intention was there, and it obviously was highlighted. As you mentioned, the conversation, it sparked this conversation, right? And it's, it's now highlighting um, the lack of diversity in the newsrooms. Uh, but but as you mentioned, you know, we, we issued a statement and we said, we understand where this is coming from, but we don't agree with uh, the, essentially the politics behind it, leaving a lot of our colleagues behind and the essence of journalism uh, to the side, right? Where it's, uh, sh she can't choose who, who, who will cover her or the way they will cover her. So Laura, yeah, what would you- Neither of our organizations are about excluding anybody. Mm -hmm. like, like, that's, just, that's just not what we're about. We're about inclusion and inclusion is a great thing. So yes. Bring us to the table, give us more opportunity, but let's not exclude people on the back of it. Yes. So, so Laura, I mean, let's start with you. What would you say some of those solutions look like? I mean, you all are talking about the work that your organizations have been doing. Yeah, well, I think that one of the biggest, uh, the, the solution that many of us talk about it, and we use that a lot, right? And, and it almost sounds empty now. It's hashtag more Latinos in news. And I think at one point when we worked with uh, NABJ for, an, uh, for a job fair, we said, hashtag more diversity in news. And that means bringing in more uh, reporters and just journalists overall of color. But I think that it's not only just bringing us in, it's also fostering our growth within the newsrooms and making sure that we have positions that uh, are also of leadership and that also um, help you know to shape the newsroom overall, because it's not just a matter of bringing in a voice and a face it's, it's really about restructuring everything within the newsroom so that we are all, as Brandon mentioned, inclusive. Absolutely. And so looking at solutions, Brandon, what do you think that newsrooms could do more to be more reflective of just diversity um, in the communities they cover with the reporters that they have? Well, that's the thing. Newsroom diversity is about being accountable to the community. Uh, Chicago is so diverse, like it's a largely black and Latino city. Uh, so it makes sense that the people that are on the ground covering it and even the people behind the scenes making decisions uh, reflect that diversity. But oftentimes that's not the case. And when that happens, you have some problematic things go down. So the best way to handle this is to foster one, a culture within these organizations of inclusion, but also fostering some sort of program and some sort of system where we, they can actually go and tap into this talent pool that NEBJ, NAHJ, and so many of our organizations have and be intentional about putting those people in positions to lead and in positions to make decisions. That is really where the change happens. You know, we see diversity on screen. It's behind the scenes where the power lies. Yes. yes. Absolutely. Um, go ahead, Laura. Yeah, if I may add, I, I think that it, uh, a big thing about when we speak about bringing more diversity in the newsrooms and more Latinos or my, more black journalists in, in news, it's not just about um, having them in there and cover certain communities or certain our communities or certain issues. 
it's literally about just you know not seeing us as the other mm. anymore we need to be fully you know a part of the conversation as a whole uh, you know as we are a part of society as part of uh, our the communities in chicago and you know chicago makes it as a whole um, our thanks to Brandon Pope and Laura Rodriguez Presa. Back to wrap things up right after this. Don't ever miss Chicago tonight. Subscribe to our podcast. Get a daily download of our show delivered to your desktop or mobile device. Go to WTTW.com slash Chicago Tonight Podcast and subscribe. And that's our show for this Monday night. Please join us tomorrow night live at 7. A vision for the construction of a future lunar colony from Chicago-based architectural powerhouse Skidmore, Owings & Merrill. And we're off to the races at Arlington Park. A look at the race course's reopening guidelines and future. And we leave you tonight with another look at the restoration of the GAR Memorial Hall in the Cultural Center. Now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Brandis Friedman. Thanks for watching, stay healthy and safe, and have a good night. Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, pleased to give back to the community through numerous charitable initiatives.